Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, Ireland's most reliable mobile network and proud sponsor of the Irish rugby team. It's been a while since we've had some Monday Night Rugby. Very happy to say Matt Williams is on the line. Hello. Hello, Joey. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good. few things to throw your way if we can. So um, we'll get on to the rugby championship. But Johnny Sexton in what seems to most people to have been the longest disciplinary uh, situation of all time. May 20th, uh, this infraction occurred. The disciplinary hearing has happened. So uh, finally, we know a three match ban for Johnny Sexton, fine of nearly €9,000 to boot, uh, which means he will miss the game against Italy and the game against England, both at the Aviva Stadium. Definitely a pity he doesn't get a farewell in his gear on the pitch there, but um, he also misses the game against Samoa. That's on in uh, Bayonne on uh, Saturday, 26th of August. So the disciplinary uh, hearing, Matt, the judgment said, uh, Johnny Sexton admitted misconduct. The disciplinary committee... Uh, found his behaviour confrontational and aggressive towards and disrespectful of the match officials. It included his pointing his finger at them and shouting at them something to this effect. It's a disgrace you can't get the big decisions right. Probably, they say, accompanied by expletives, most likely the F word, they say. Uh, that's Sexton's um, description of the event included there in their in their. Uh, written finding. His conduct was obviously unsportsmanlike and brought the sport of rugby into disrepute. Now I haven't read the full 36 pages but I did see a colleague a journalist here, a rugby journalist Neil Tracy, he was saying that um, really they suggested that had it not been for Sexton's admission of guilt, him admitting what he said as, he, as described above and also his clean record, then that three game ban very easily could have been six, which would have ruled him out of the game against South Africa as well as Romania and Tonga. So far from ideal for a guy who hasn't played since March, but uh, he will play in the World Cup and he won't be missing for any games. So I don't know, you shrug your shoulders, you move on kind of thing? You do, Joe. Look, I think one of the great things about rugby still is our respect for officials, how we address them and how we go about them. And... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a cliche, but uh, our players are role models. And when you're one of our greatest ever players, uh, you are a role model. And Johnny's been, he's had a superb career as far as that goes. But, he, you know, you, you can't go to officials as frustrating, as disappointing, as heartbreaking it is and do what he did. You just can't do it. And the thing is, if it's not punished, then that is an example for kids and clubs and all that, and, it, and you, we just can't have it. And it's very unfortunate for him because he's had such a wonderful career, and, he, and he's not a Johnny's not a dirty player, or, or you know he's aggressive and and one is a winner, and which is what we expect. But um, look, if he if he's done that, which they said he did, and he's admitted it, he was going to get a suspension. And look, I I think um, all the things they said to miss the warm up games in some ways is a blessing because I don't think Johnny can do the whole tournament. I don't think his body's going to allow him. He probably would have been lovely to give him some time at the Aviva as a send-off. But uh, as Michael Checker said when he lost his last game in charge of Leinster, uh, it's not a fairy tale. And uh, I look, I, I don't want to see Johnny put out, and I don't want to do any of that. But we do have to maintain standards. You can see the problems that the GAA have trying to regain the standards on how um, the, 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 the difficulties they had early this year with their officials being abused and so on, which is just, it's not on in any way. Rugby doesn't have that at the moment and, and we can't let it ever creep in. And I think uh, Johnny's, suffered's not the right word, but he, he's got the consequences of, of some, some poor decisions under great, uh, great disappointment. I did see on rugby Twitter, which as you know is a reasonable place at the best of times but some English rugby fans were saying well hang on Dylan Hartley got 11 weeks for uh, having to go at Wayne Barnes I suppose the difference there is that in that case Hartley used the word cheat which he implied some kind of like intentional action on, on Barnes's behalf whereas Johnny and Ferriston was just saying you're completely inept which is uh, <laughs> not as bad I suppose Johnny wasn't playing as well Johnny was, was not, not on the file 
And uh, with great respect to Dylan, he had a uh, charge sheet as long as your arm. True, true. <laughs> so, so they said, you know, I, I thought I, I would if he got six weeks without his without his exemplary record, he would have got six weeks, and I, I think that's that's fair enough. Uh, maybe maybe more. So look, look the, the only other thing on that is justice delayed is justice denied, and this should have been dealt with very very quickly to have this to have us still talking about this in august is not good it's not good for the game it's not fair on johnny it's not fair on anyone mm. it should have been probably within seven days of the match it's uh, quite poor so just a last one on all this and this is more for the snc people and i guess sexton to be fair to him has a lengthy track record at this stage of being able to come back with very little rugby and mm. produce but he now won't have any rugby in the warm-up games. He hasn't played since that day against England in March. So we're talking about a six-month layoff here. So you got Romania, Tonga, and then South Africa. Do you, what, give him 60 against Romania? Do you, do you rest him totally against Tonga, or do you have to get another 50, 60 into him to be at his best against South Africa? Or, or very hard to say at this vantage point, perhaps, man. Yeah, it is, Joe. If, if we come back to your original point, what the Irish strength and conditioning staff under Jason Cowman have done absolutely superbly is bring players back from long breaks and they perform in games. Mm. In the old days, we'd say, look, it takes you two or three games to get up to speed. You know, match fit and all this sort of, um, the, te- the terminology we use maybe five to 10 years ago. And the, the SNC from the Irish uh, rugby community is just absolutely superb. So yes, Johnny can come in. But there is other factors. The other players have to get used to, to him. I would think he certainly gets as much time as the, as the, doc, the, the medical staff and the SNC staff say in the first match. And then in the second match against Tonga, that's a hugely physical game. Tonga have got a lot of good players coming back in under the good side of this law that's not being abused by the Tier 1 nations where a lot of the former Tonga players who play for Australia and New Zealand haven't played for three years or allowed now to play for Tonga. So they're going to, and they are, Tonga at the best of times are physical. So Johnny's, I think, has got to play part of that uh, with Ross maybe doing most of the second half or whoever they decide to do. I shouldn't say Ross Byrne. There's no guarantees Ross will do it. But you've got to have sex and ready to play as long as we can against South Africa because South Africa are showing real signs of the fatigue that we spoke of the last time we spoke, Joe, a couple of weeks ago, from their long season that started September 22. They haven't had a really meaningful break since then. And when the pace of the game that New Zealand put on them the other day, they couldn't live with it. Yeah. So if Ireland, and that's what Ireland are also good at, putting tempo and pace on the game, especially when Sexton's on the field because he's a master at it. Uh, so you certainly want Sexton on there as long as you can against South Africa. Yes, fair enough. And just a very last one, and then I do want to talk to you about the rugby championship. Is all the focus on the South African game uh, warranted? As in, and this will come back to haunt me, no doubt, but Ireland should beat Scotland based on Murrayfield, and so they'll be in the top two in the group regardless of how they go against South Africa. There's no value really in beating South Africa. Like you could have the match of your lives and you're still playing France or New Zealand. It's almost academic in some respects. I mean, the coaching staff will never admit that. And and, and I don't know, maybe there is such a thing as tournament momentum. And so you don't want to get spanked by South Africa, clearly. But I, I just wonder, what, what's the value in going out there and putting in this physical performance of the ages early on in this tournament against South Africa? It's a very good point, it, you know, and that's the difficulty of their pool because the Tonga and Scotland aren't exactly pushovers, and and your reward for beating South Africa could be playing France or New Zealand. <laughs> Not much of a reward. No, no. I mean, I'd, I'd be saying to anyone who has a niggle against South Africa, listen, get ready for two weeks' time. That's the game. And the court finals, what it's all about. I, I agree with you, Chad. And and there is there is the the. Uh, well, for a start, if you go, you, you, if you go to an international rugby team and say, well, listen, boys, boys, this match doesn't matter, we're not going to do much, they, they just lose all respect for you. You sure. can't do that. Sure. And, and sure. It's just, they're just not that piece. You know, you lose them, that will create more problems than it would solve. The, the, the second part of that is um, you definitely do get energy and momentum from winning, and I think you can technically knock South Africa out. You, you don't want to pick South Africa up again. 
If you're going to beat them, put them out of the tournament. And I think if they beat them, they'll put them out of the tournament. And then they know that, that you know, where, where does that lead them? Or at least there's one of them gone. But uh, I agree with you, there's not much of a reward for that win. Mm. We are two rounds into the rugby championship. New Zealand are two wins for two. They've beaten Argentina and South Africa. South Africa, they beat Australia day one and then obviously lost to New Zealand. That was in Auckland on uh, Saturday. And Australia lost to South Africa away in round one and then very dramatic, amazing second half, last 15, 20 minutes against Argentina. And ultimately they lost as well. So Australia, uh, two games played, no wins. There is a rest week and then we'll reconvene in two weeks time Australia will host New Zealand that's in Melbourne South Africa will host Argentina and this is very much a sprint finish on account of the World Cup there's no home and away routine here and just a a broad question about what you're seeing in the rugby championship Matt this time of year and and maybe um, it depends on a given coach and a given team and a a given point in a, a cycle or whatever but with the World Cup looming large is this a markedly different tournament to non World Cup years is there lots of experimentation going on or is it is it all out uh there is some experimentation going on some uh rotation of players in in every side except Argentina I think Argentina will be much more um, in, in, in just two games, Joe. So it's not you know you can't get a trend out of two games. But they're sticking with their starting fifteen very much, so, and I think they have to uh, for them to succeed. They've got to have their starting fifteen beating uh, England in the uh, in the pool stages. So they would be working on getting as much cohesion between them as they could. New Zealand and South Africa are slightly different in that they're on the other side of the pool. So we saw. Uh, David McKenzie playing 10 last week and Richie Monger uh, starting there this week with Bowden Barrett at fullback, um, which I think the game against South Africa, we saw um, the New Zealanders pick their best side. Uh, and I think the South Africans generally pick their best side. And, and I think they have some, the South Africans have some real problems at 10. Uh, they, they really, uh, the bell at 10 was quite poor in defence and attack and he's kicking. And uh, they are are really showing signs of struggling there. And I I should come at that from the other angle, Joe. New Zealand are head and shoulders above the other teams at the moment. The way New Zealand played, if you don't watch anything across the summer, if you're having a break from rugby uh, over the summer, do yourself a favour and watch the first 20 minutes of the New Zealand-South Africa game. It's as good as anything you will ever see. the, The pace and precision tempo of the New Zealanders was off the planet and they simply kept going there and the South African defence was was brave and, and organised and I, I just kept thinking how can they hold, how can they hold, bang, they couldn't hold they just, they finally fell apart at about the 8 minute mark and then New Zealand just kept coming at them and coming at them and it was uh, the game was it's, it's hard to say it was all over because the South Africans did come back a bit but the lead the New Zealanders had was almost insurmountable at the 20 minute mark. Yeah. They, they were absolutely superb, Joe. Absolutely top shelf. The final score was 35 20. 17 nil up in that first 20 minutes that you're uh, raving about and I saw it there was just um, I've watched highlights I didn't get to watch, watch the game in full I read a few reports about it as well uh, one uh, piece in the uh, Times said they kicked cleverly to manipulate the opposition back three they were moving the ball away from the contact area with flurries of offloads they limited South Africa to just 10 lineouts across the game uh, turned it into a brilliant aerial contest as well kept the ball in play uh, tempo and, and you mentioned the uh, precision. Were you looking at this game and feeling I can see some Joe Schmidt all over this or, or, or less so? I mean, off, a flurry of offloads wouldn't have been his MO with Ireland, obviously, but maybe in New Zealand there's obviously a pressure to do that. Well, I think the breakdown work was absolutely flawless. Like New Zealand, it was so, so, again, this concept of New Zealand says LQB, lightning quick ball at the breakdown, to try and keep each ruck under 1.5 seconds. If you can get a number of those together, the concept is the tempo and the pace that you put on the game with with rucks under one and a half seconds, the defence simply can't get organised in that, you know, they can't keep doing it. You can see that. 
in that, and that was Joe's job. I mean, in the box, Joe was prowling in the background. I don't know Joe's exact remit, mm-hmm. and I would suspect he has a lot to do with coordinating the coaches and getting the coaches themselves to do it. Um, Dougie Ryan, the assistant coach for the forwards, I mean, the scrummaging and line-up play was, was flawless, but the backline attack and the passing was so precise at such pace. I mean, they're flying onto the ball. These are really great athletes, and every pass was in front of the player at the exact spot where their hands needed them. It, it, it was just brilliant. And, and, and here's the other thing, Joe, that when the product when the, is like that, when the game is like that, it's the best thing in the world to watch. It's literally the best game in the world to watch for those when the game is like that. It then, in the second half and the Wallabies game, we, we fall into our old problem. They were scrummaging for penalties. The penalty was awarded. They kicked the touch. They have a line out. They have a more boring. And the rest of the backs did nothing. Right at the end of the game, the New Zealanders had a five-metre scrum. And we're thinking, oh, well, will they kill it? Will they just go for the penalty? And the ball went in and came out in a second. Uh, so they picked the ball up, ran wide, passed the rich longer. Yeah. And the South African back line, which had hardly ever defended a scrum, because all the opposition is doing a push the scrum, they're not actually passing the ball. They had no idea how to defend it. And rich longer just scored a try. So surely that sends a message to World Cup coaches out there. Listen, if you have a scrum and you actually pass the ball out of the scrum, the backs are not used to this. There's lots of space. Like, think of something new. Be creative. Be, be initi- have an initiative. The good thing, and I, I know the South African supporters will say, well, I'm, I'm picking on them, but I don't mean that. I think South Africa's game plan has really hit a, hit a, a wall. Now, they boot Australia very easily. Australia are absolutely, you know, they're really poor at the moment. Really, really poor. But the South African game plan against the big boys, and let's say the big four, New Zealand, France, uh, and Ireland, including the South Africans, they are not coping well against those teams. And I think they need a big, big rethink on what they do before the World Cup. And I think they are really, as I said, they're, they're, they're tens, like Luke Am is on the field. Luke Am is one of the best outside centers, if not the best outside center in the world. They hardly called his name on Saturday. They just he just didn't see the game. So they're not playing. They're playing to some of their strengths, which is their forwards. But th- that's not going to mix it against the top four. And, and, and they've lost. Were they, were they playing sorry. a bit? Were they playing a bit more rugby South Africa when they won the World Cup four years ago, or no? Uh, in the final, they didn't. They played a little bit more as they came through. But since the Lions. Uh, in, in the middle of, of this World Cup cycle, of course, we had that disastrous lines to it. Since winning that, the South Africans have shown very, very little expansion to their game, except when they're on top or a long way behind. Right? If yeah. they're right on top, they've got enough to lose. In Adelaide last year, Australia scored a couple of tries and they were in trouble. They actually had to play. But when they're going out against the top three teams, they're not matching it. It's just not working for them. Mm. And I, I think they're in some... Um, some real strong. Okay, interesting. On um, New Zealand, there was obviously that crisis point where they had seven defeats in 12 matches and Foster's job looked under immediate threat. Since they lost to Argentina 10 months ago now, they've gone nine games unbeaten. And as, as you've said, you, you feel they're head and shoulders above everybody else in this tournament at the moment. Uh, that Bowden, Barrett at 15 and Moonga at 10 combination I, I, I was reading a few different people saying that after you know initially being criticised when Hansen tried to do it for you know shoehorning uh, players in it's now starting to dovetail, dovetail and, and click quite nicely would you agree with that? Yeah yeah, and, and the other Barrett at 12 too he's been um, he's been superb in that change from from fullback or winger to uh, to first centre he, he has just been so so powerful in there and it's, it's a very very well balanced uh, group of players that they've got there with McK- you know and McKenzie probably on the bench in the yeah. future a lovely player McKenzie I mean in most oh, of the countries to take him yeah he, he'd be starting with any other team but had a great super tournament for the Chiefs Damian McKenzie and um, you know got his start last week against Argentina and did play really really well and this is again what I'm saying the rotation they're putting these players through um, but I do think that's the best starting 15 in New Zealand at the moment. I think, you know, Joe, I I have deepest respect for the Kiwis because I've been against them my whole life. 
But the last year when they were losing, it was just, the way they treated Foster and their team was a disgrace. I've said that before and I'll say it again. Now they're winning. Oh, everything's cool. You know, like, I, I really don't have a lot of time for those comments from them because they're not, they just they never, ever allow their coaches or their team to have a bad six weeks, to even try things. We've got to, like, we're, we're a year out from the World Cup, we've got to try things They mightn't work. Yeah, they've got to win. Unless they're winning every single game, every single week, there's a crisis. And that can be a very much a negative in a World Cup, which we saw, we saw for 20 years, was. But I, I, I really, and I really feel for Foster, and that's why he's not running again. It, it took a huge toll on him personally. And I'm really glad they're winning for him because he got abused like no coach should. No one should ever be abused in sport. They're just sportsmen. And he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't win the game with disrepute. He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. His team was just losing. And uh, I, I'm really pleased for him and Joe that uh, the team is doing doing so well. I think it's uh, uh, because, let me tell you, Joe, absolute joy to watch. Yeah. That was a yeah, no, pleasure. The tries were beautiful. And even um, <laughs> Will Jordan, 22 tries in 22 tests can you imagine uh, and he's been battling uh, vertigo and migraines that ruled him out of the November series but geez, he looked um, electric at the weekend he was he was just gloriously balanced runner just brilliant set up that first try yeah uh, you know, and Aaron Smith's support lines Aaron Smith's passing is just it's so effortless each one of those passes is flat like a bullet 25 metres time and time again both hands all game he's always on anyone makes a break he's there on the inside he's uh, you know it is, it is really beautiful mm. beautiful run. so so sorry now have we figured out who we want in the quarter final have we got a definitive answer here <laughs> friends friends who are absolutely superb and just won the under 20s as we all know or New Zealand, mm. playing great rugby. Take your choice. Oh man, I think uh, Joe Schmidt's official, official title is the Godfather. I think that's what they have him down on the uh, New Zealand website. As by the way, um, <laughs> Australia. Let's talk Australia. So they've slipped to eighth in the world rankings, beaten by South Africa, who did rest twelve starters for that New Zealand game we've just been discussing. Beaten forty three twelve, and then very dramatic game against Argentina. They lost by three points in the end. They thought they'd won it, and then they thought they lost it, thought they'd won it, and then eventually they lost it uh, with last-minute scores happening several times over. So 34 points to 31. Uh, the Eddie Jones revamp, obviously, was um, much discussed. He's been in since January. He uh, he yanked off his headset at the end of the game and, and banged it on the table a few times. He said afterwards, there's probably no one more despondent than me. I've ruined about three radios in the coach's box there. It was always going to be difficult if you're coming off a base where you've been consistently unsuccessful for a period of time. We are trying to change the team, but we're also trying to change the way that we play. I'm also quite happy to tell you, though, that I think we're on the right track and we will get there. It would have been easy if I'd come in, taken the job and paired everything back and we had played a really simple game plan. But that's not going to win us a World Cup. So, like, on the one hand, Matt, to me, that reads as, as very reasonable and, and from a guy who's been there and done it and really knows what he's talking about. It also, though, if you're being less charitable, reads like his England media playbook across much of 2022. Don't worry about what you've just seen there. Trust me. It's all going to be fine when we get to the World Cup. Trust me. Don't worry about anything. So um, I guess he deserves a little bit more wiggle room when he's just into a new job as a Australian coach as opposed to five, six years into an English gig. Yeah. Hundred percent, Joe. Uh, but, but again, uh, we say it all the time. Every national team is a hostage to the system below, and it's the system below the Wallabies that has made the Wallabies where they are for the last fifteen years. Just as the system below the Irish national team is what's making the Irish national team so successful, pumping players, playing a style of rugby, having a philosophy. And uh, look, I was talking to a former Wallaby today who's doing his level four and I'm his, his level four mentor and we were talking, discussing this. And, and there's just no philosophy in Australia and it's the systems in Australia below that we have neglected and let go that has stopped this. It's not Eddie's fault, right? let's, let's put it there. The problem Eddie faces is, is he was brought back because he, to Australia because of his high profile. Australia, the profile of rugby in Australia was absolutely zero. Dave Renner was a really nice guy, really respectful. He wasn't New Zealand, uh, an Australian, he's a New Zealand, so he didn't feel he had to go, should go out there. He, he thought that was respectful. 
So what the Australian rugby want? We don't we want a high price. They bring Eddie back and he just talks the game up. Uh, again, I was talking an ex-rugby league international who's not a dis- has a disdain for rugby, <laughs> got up in the middle of the night to watch the Wallabies against South Africa because the all Eddie said, turn it off at half time. And the whole thing, it was over-promising, over-promising, over-promising. The Wallabies have been really, really poor. And, and look, at the, Eddie needs to take some responsibility. He's appointed assistants, just like he did in England, many of them from rugby league. Uh, he picked a guy called Seabold to run his defence in England. Now, Seabold has come back to his rugby league guy, had zero, zero rugby experiences. His first experience in rugby was a test match as a defensive coach. Now, he's gone back to run Manly Warringah rugby league side. He's a fantastic coach. Good bloke. He's brought him, Eddie's brought in Brett Hodge. Brett, Brett Hodge was played for rugby league for my club, the West Tigers. He then went over and coached Holland rugby league, has never coached a game of rugby in his life, and he's the defence coach for the Wallabies. And the Wallabies' defence has been really poor. But I don't blame Brett because it takes him time to learn. But how do you pick a guy to be like, it'd be like me going into, into rugby league and saying, I've never coached, or I have done a bit of coaching rugby league, but I've never coached at the top level of rugby league. So you're the attack coach. You, you know, like, you yeah. go, well, yeah. are there, aren't there people better qualified than Matt to do that? And, and this is, this is, and he brought in a whole new staff. He got rid of a lot of really good Australian coaches, brought in a new staff. It's just not gelling. But the players psychologically don't look right. And, you know, Argentina deserved to win that. Um, I thought the intercept by um, Mark, well, I always struggled with Mark's name, went to the same school as me. No, I said T. Sorry, Mark, say, that, say that again. I know, no chance. <laughs> okay, we'll I was practicing before we came on. Mark was at least a metre and a half off, so he took the intercept. Okay. Well, and he's like lightning, went to length, scored a try. It's great. And, and the, you watch the Australians were trying to get that kick in really quick and everyone's going, he's offside, he's offside, and they didn't replay it, they got it. Right. And then, but how many times have we seen Australia lose a game in the last two minutes over the last five years? Mm. I, I can think of six times, even, even against Ireland, the scrum penalty that Ross Byrne kicked over. There's just so many games, they just, there's something psychologically wrong when they can't close out a game, even games they don't deserve to win. So the, the, the road back for Australian rugby joke is a long and rocky one. Uh, it's not going to fix one bloke, even someone as good as Eddie, is yeah. not going to fix that straight away. To blame him is wrong, but Australian rugby has set him up because they've let him come out there and do all the talking. Yes. And I, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not a pleasant place where he's going to be because I, don't, I can't see the Wallabies being successful as much as I would like them to be. Mm. Which is a pity because, as we've all said and you've said numerous times, their route through to the final, if they were in reasonable shape, would be pretty generous. Um, on them, um, Jones, and you, you've a great feel for him. You know him a long time. You've told us before he is like a, a genuine workaholic. People use that phrase lightly, but he is an al- yeah. I, I, <laughs> I retract that one. He is a workaholic. Workaholic. That's me. Um, but he. Um, there's a certain crankiness about him like early on there, there, there's no honeymoon phase and I sort of think he had this long intense workaholic stint with England which is a high profile job ends like in dismal failure gets the sack slingshots into this Australian gig and you know so after the South African defeat it's put to him that beforehand he had been saying God he, he hoped South Africa played their best team because he didn't want to come and beat a half-baked South African side and that was put to him after the game and he said well you don't have to be a smart ass and gets into kind of an off-mic exchange again it's nothing too out of the ordinary but it was it was notable and then after the loss to Argentina, uh, the Australian press officer was trying to bring the thing to a close and, and Jones interrupted the press officer and said, no, let him go, mate, fire away, boys. This might be the last chance you get to do this. I, it, it, like, it, it sounds like a guy there who's been on the treadmill a long time. That's, that's not a, I'm fresh, I'm rejuvenated, I'm enthusiastic kind of a, a demeanour. What, what, again, maybe I'm over-reading into that. It's, it's a really good point, Joe. Um, yeah, he just seems oversensitive at the moment. But when he, when when Eddie was in England and England were playing well, which they we have to give him credit, they did for a long period and they had a great World Cup 2019. That semi final against New Zealand will go down as one of the great games of all time. Um, he he was 
he was like leading press conferences like they were entertainment. Yeah. They weren't actually talking about rugby. He was entertaining and he was throwing lines and he was doing that. So he set that up and that's a very dangerous precedent because it can come back at you and that's what's occurring at the moment. So you can do all that when you're winning and, and they'll let you get away with it. But journos remember your words and when you lose, they'll throw them back at you. Now, was there some disrespect in there? For sure, but he's not the first coach who's been disrespected in a press conference when they lose. Uh, I've got no problem with him standing up for himself, mm. none at all. But uh, I do, I do get the feeling, and look, Eddie had a slight stroke a few years ago because he just works himself into the ground. I've never seen anyone in any walk of life work like he does. You know, 3 a.m. phone calls are unusual if you're on his staff. He just does not stop. He hasn't got a clock. But that has, that, that you know, that bears down on relationships and, and, and yet with staff and players, that, that's what Eddie has failed at in the past. Re- really, his rugby hasn't failed. He's relation, keeping his relationships going. And if he's short-tempered with these guys as they go through, that's not good because this is a team that's got a long journey. He's... he's he signed up to the Home World Cup in, in 2029 in Australia. He has to keep those relationships on track. And that's not that's that's what he has to work at because that's not what he's good at. He's brilliant at rugby, but he's also a little bit too clever for everyone. That's why he brought in all these rugby league coaches with no experience that, that blew up in his face. And I think it's, it's not going well for him in the short term. Mm. And then he'd come out and say, if I was New Zealand, I'd be scared. Like, wow. Yeah, strange. You know, wow. Why, why would you poke the bear? Why would you say that, you know? Yeah, that was a really strange comment. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't even work out what he was trying to do there. Yeah, well, again, it's just trying to deflect things. Like, if he's trying to take the heat off his players and put it on him, okay, that's a strategy. I get that and I admire it. And sometimes coaches do that. If they think there's too much heat on their players, give it to me, I'll take it. Sure. Leave the ball alone. But, mate, I think he's only going to put 50 or 60 on this is this is just the way they played the last two games, and the way New Zealand are playing. You can't come to any other conclusion that that there's a minimum of forty points and possibly a lot more coming the wall of his way. Okay. Um, just the last one, and uh, I mean, you could probably do, and maybe we should some night and get a a, a couple of um, people from the club on to tell us a bit more about it. But I did um, watching the Argentina. Australia game as the camera cuts from Michael Cheka in one coach's box to Eddie Jones in another coach's box and I think they're former they're certainly both of Randwick and maybe even yeah. former teammates yeah. Yeah. it's like this wild it's just the most ridiculous club Randwick what 5-6k suburb of Sydney and it's like this kind of very important centre point of, of rugby and here you have two guys coaching here uh, half the rugby championship coaching uh, head coaching staff yeah, yeah, it's been a it's it, it's been a blessing for Australian rugby and a, and a curse. The blessing is that that Randwick dominated Australian rugby from the 1920s to the 1980s, and probably beyond into the 90s. But uh, unless you came from Randwick, you couldn't get a gig. I, I I was one of the only guys who got a gig that wasn't from Randwick. I was from East and West. So the same sort of thing's the case, you know, the Randwick people, and, and, the, and it's a mafia, you know, the, the Randwick mafia, they, they support each other, they go through and all that. If they're the best person for the job, I've got no problems with it, but on many occasions they haven't been, and a lot of good people have been shut out because of that. So that's the negative. Mm. But they are very loyal. The Randwick boys are exceptionally loyal to their club. Phil, look, you're looking at Phil Kearns, who's head of the um, World Cup, bid, the one men's and women's World Cup for Australia. Ramwick, uh, you know, the, you, you start going through the Ramwick, Al Gaffney, Ramwick. There, there's a lot, uh, um, so many. And, and what guys would do, they would leave their club where they were, their junior club would go to Ramwick because they thought that was the way you go forward. I'm in Narbonne here and there's five guys, five Australians in Narbonne or Ramwick. Hmm. So it, it, it is this type of uh, we're the best and we know we're the best, so we don't care about anyone else. In some ways, that's been a blessing for Australian rugby. And in some ways, it's held it back. Uh, but it is an extraordinary place to go and play uh, when they had the three other boys 
they would have Wallabies playing in their second 15. Wow. And uh, they, they, were, they were extraordinary in their pond. They changed, they changed world rugby. You had the three Ellers playing at Randwick. Under that philosophy, as we've spoken about that, that's the club that brought the, the uh, game line philosophy back from the 1927 Waratahs. Changed world rugby. It's still the philosophy that, that the only way to attack in world rugby is the game line. It's changed over the years how you do it. But they ran that and they were absolutely incredible when they did. There's no two ways about it. The great wins in Australia through the 80s and 90s, Grand Slam winning Blitters like Cups, 91 World Cup, Bob Dwyer, coach to Bramwick, 300 games to Bramwick. That's what they were, for sure. Mm. Um, and then they, they got up, as you say, they got up in the next morning on the Sunday and there was a, a fundraiser for the Bramwick Club and Eddie and Michael were both there talking uh, and they were very loyal to the club. And, you know, they, lo- they loved it. And I, I really admire that about them. Uh, we gotta let you go we'll talk again soon thanks so much so it's a great talk to you mate likewise Matt Williams there with us live on the line Monday Night Rugby is of course with thanks to Vodafone Ireland's most reliable mobile network and proud sponsor of the Irish Rugby Team Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone Ireland's most reliable mobile network and proud sponsor of the Irish Rugby Team 